This is the mop-up for September 7th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. On Tuesday, the leader of the Proud Boys, Enrique Terrio, was sentenced to 22 years in prison for the role he played in the January 6th attack on our nation's capital. But Ron DeSantis, Mr. Law and Order, thinks these sentences that they're handing out to J6ers are excessive. Appearing on Newsmax on Wednesday, Ron DeSantis couldn't wait to play the race card when talking about January 6th. And keep in mind that the NAACP has issued a travel advisory for Florida because of Ron DeSantis. The NAACP is saying it is no longer safe for African Americans to visit Florida. So this is what Ron DeSantis said on Wednesday on Newsmax about the sentencing of these January Sixers. Quote, there are some examples of people that should not have been prosecuted. They just walked into the Capitol. They didn't walk into the Capitol. They crawled through broken windows and over the bodies of fallen police officers. Quote, if they were Black Lives Matter, this is what Ron DeSantis said Wednesday night about the January Sixers. Quote, if they were Black Lives Matter, they would not have been prosecuted. No, because they would have been shot on sight. And we all know that. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that. It's such a cliche at this point to, to say, had any of those January Sixers been black, they would have been massacred. We all know that. And yet this racist Ron DeSantis says, if they were BLM, they would not have been prosecuted. <sighs> he goes on to say, then there's other examples of people that probably did commit misconduct. They may have been violent, but to say it's an act of terrorism when it was basically a protest that devolved into a riot to do excessive sentences, you can look at, OK, maybe they were guilty, but 22 years if other people that did other things got six months. Yeah, some people get 22 years if you're engaged in seditious conspiracy. And some people, if you break a couple of windows, but you don't hurt anybody, you get six months. Not all crimes are equal, Ron DeSantis. So you say it was a riot, Ron DeSantis, and you think the sentences are excessive for a riot. Really, because last week, in the aftermath of Hurricane Idalia, Governor DeSantis warned rioters of this. You loot, we shoot. Hmm. You loot, we shoot. If there's a riot after a hurricane and people start looting, what, what do you do? Governor Ron DeSantis, what did you warn? You loot, we shoot. You loot, we shoot. Well, this is one of your Florida constituents, Governor Ron DeSantis. His name is Adam Johnson, okay? He's a stay-at-home father of five boys. He traveled from the beloved state of Florida to uh, Washington, D.C., and he literally looted Speaker Pelosi's office. You see him? He stole her podium, and he's been sentenced, but... He was looting the Capitol, and under your reasoning... You loot, we shoot. Yes, but the sentences, the sentencing is too stiff because they're white. You're a racist, a dangerous, homophobic, racist Ron DeSantis. Well, it now seems to be a foregone conclusion that Claudia Scheinbaum, the former mayor of Mexico City will be elected as the next president of Mexico in 2024. Mexico's ruling Morena party named her as their nominee, which pretty much guarantees her win in next year's presidential election. Mexico's current president, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, is also a member of Morena. And according to their constitution down in Mexico, he's only allowed to serve one six-year term. We are getting reports uh, this morning that President Biden's son, Hunter, 
will be indicted sometime uh, before the end of this month. Uh, Hunter Biden will be indicted by a grand jury as soon as Friday, September 29th. David Weiss is the newly appointed special counsel investigating Hunter Biden's failure to pay taxes, as well as his falsifying an application on a gun purchase. Uh, Well, we're getting reports that David Weiss, the newly appointed special counsel, filed court documents Wednesday indicating that he will seek the indictments as soon as possible. If you remember back in June, Hunter Biden was charged with failure to pay more than $100,000 in federal taxes on income of more than $1.5 million that he earned in 2017 and 2018. This was while he was suffering from a crack cocaine addiction. Hunter was expected to plead guilty in a deal with prosecutors that would have included supervised probation on an additional guilty plea to lying while filling out an application to purchase a gun in which he claimed not to be a drug user at the time. The deal with prosecutors fell apart after a Trump-appointed judge raised questions about the role she was supposed to play in all this. And this prompted Attorney General Merrick Garland to name David Weiss, who was already on the case in Delaware. Merrick Garland named David Weiss as a special counsel, granting him a much broader scope to investigate Hunter Biden's business dealings, as well any link that Joe Biden might have. As it stands now, despite all the investigations in Congress. There have been three committees looking into this. Uh, there, Hunter's legal problems, uh, uh, they have not been able to link Joe Biden to any of this. Uh, right now, Hunter's legal problems are the following. He didn't pay taxes and he lied on a gun application, which in normal circumstances would make him a hero in Republican circles, right? The guy doesn't want to pay taxes and he wants to buy a gun. What's more Republican than that? Republicans will be disappointed to learn that their own lax gun control policies could grant Hunter Biden a get-out-of-jail-free card. A Louisiana federal appeals court last month ruled that prohibiting drug users from owning guns is unconstitutional. On August 10th, a three-judge panel for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans set precedent ruling on a matter that is separate from Hunter Biden, but it involves letting drug addicts buy guns. And they wrote, quote, Our history and tradition may support some limits on an intoxicated person's right to carry a weapon, But it does not justify disarming a sober citizen based exclusively on his past drug usage, unquote. This ruling could make its way up to the Supreme Court, who are more likely than not to decide drug addicts, just like terrorists, have every right to own a weapon. Meanwhile, three, three separate congressional investigations have failed so far to produce any evidence that Hunter's questionable business dealings in any way implicate his father, Joe Biden. Speaker Kevin McCarthy earlier this week said that he believes launching hearings to determine whether he should go ahead and impeach Joe Biden, those hearings seem like, quote, the natural evolution in the political process. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene warned that if impeachment proceedings don't start moving, she will vote against a short-term spending bill that would keep our government running past September. Speaker McCarthy has informed the MAGA wing of his caucus that shutting down the government means we can't impeach Joe Biden, so let's keep the place open. The question remains... What kind of guarantees of an impeachment inquiry will the MAGA wing get from Speaker McCarthy before they agree to keep the government running? 
McCarthy has yet to endorse Donald Trump for president and has also denied reports that he is going to cave into pressure and introduce legislation in the House to get Trump's two impeachments expunged from the record, something that cannot be done legally. You can't do something like that. An impeachment is an indictment, and unlike, say, a congressional censure, you cannot reverse or expunge an indictment. A new morning consult poll of 5,000 likely voters shows that if the presidential election were held today, Joe Biden would defeat Donald Trump by nearly three percentage points. The real clear politics averages of all the major polls shows that if the election were held today, Joe Biden would defeat Donald Trump by a little less than one percentage point. Here's where it starts getting interesting. Jenna Griswold is Colorado Secretary of State, and she is the first Democrat to hold that position in Colorado since 1963. One of the chief roles of any Secretary of State is to administer elections. Secretaries of State are elected, so their jobs are political in nature. And in the past, Republicans, like Florida's Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, back in 2000, and Georgia's then Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, in 2018, have used their positions to scrub just enough black people from the voting rolls to secure a victory for their party. If you remember, that's how George W. Bush stole Florida. His brother, Jeb, and Catherine Harris scrubbed the Florida voting rolls of black people and that made it easier for George W. Bush to steal Florida in 2000. And in 2018, Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State of Florida. He was running for governor. Uh, Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State of Georgia, and he was running for governor against Stacey Abrams. And he went in there and scrubbed about 50,000 people, black people, from the voting rolls and secured his win over Stacey Abrams in 2018. So a new lawsuit is raising the question, instead of scrubbing black people from the voting rolls, would Colorado's Democratic Secretary of State do Republicans one better by scrubbing Donald Trump completely off the ballot? Six Colorado voters filed suit against Colorado's Secretary of State this week, demanding she remove Donald Trump's name from the ballot, insisting the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause permanently bans Donald Trump from ever holding office again. This is really interesting. Now, according to the lawsuit, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment bars from office any person who swore an oath, quote, to support the Constitution of the United States as a federal or state officer and then engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or gave aid or comfort to the enemies thereof unless Congress removes such disability by a two-thirds vote. That's in the 14th Amendment. If anybody who once held elective office aided and abetted or engaged in an insurrection, they are permanently banned from ever holding office. That would be Donald Trump. And in order to restore his right to hold office again, Congress would have to uh, vote. It would be a two-thirds vote in each chamber of of the legislature to allow Donald Trump to hold elective office again. So... This is uh, interesting because it's somewhat reminiscent of the legal reasoning behind John Eastman's and Kenneth Cheesebro's legal memos outlining the phony elector scheme in 2020, as well as their explanation for why the role of the vice president on January 6th is more than just ceremonial, right? You know, Eastman wrote these memos saying that Pence, if he so wished, could refuse to certify the presidential election. The difference being 
the difference between this invocation of the 14th Amendment and Eastman and Cheesebro's legal memos, the difference is that Eastman and Cheesebro, they wrote memos based on flimsy interpretations of the 12th Amendment, and they had no idea what was in the Electoral Count Act, but they wrote those memos anyway, and it's why they're standing trial in Georgia this morning. So this lawsuit in Colorado is based on actual law, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which specifically bans any office seeker from serving again if they at one time swore an oath to uphold the Constitution and then violated that oath, either by engaging in or aiding and abetting an insurrection against the United States government. Now, the question is, who decides whether January 6 was, in fact, an insurrection? Well, according to this lawsuit, that would be left up to Colorado or any other state's to decide their courts. It would be up to first the Secretary of State, and then, of course, it would be challenged. So it would be up to the courts to decide whether or not Donald Trump violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And that is the correct reading of the 14th Amendment. That is, uh, according to Lawrence Tribe and other legal scholars, that is the process outlined in the 14th Amendment on how to ban somebody from seeking office again. In other way, in other words, uh, the same way Trump and his co-conspirators went battleground state by battleground state immediately after the 2020 presidential election, trying to convince state legislatures to replace the Biden electors with Trump electors, this new legal push seems to be going battleground state by battleground state, trying to convince secretaries of state, obviously they would have to be Democratic secretaries of state, to remove Trump from the ballot. Obviously, baked into this lawsuit would be Trump challenging the Colorado secretary of state in court. That would be, we're assuming Jenna Griswold, Colorado's current Secretary of State, she's a Democrat. Let's assume she removes Trump's name from her state's ballot. That's the current lawsuit, right? And then it will be challenged again in the courts. It will go to the state Supreme Court. And then eventually the, the Supreme Court justices in Washington, D.C. would be forced theoretically to decide what? Was January 6 an insurrection? And what? Was Donald Trump the leader of it? Did he violate his oath of office by leading it? This is what the Supreme Court, it would be left to the Supreme Court to decide if a secretary of state is well within her rights to strike Donald Trump's name from the ballot. Very interesting. With the general election more than a year away, it is conceivable that this lawsuit, along with similar ones, will make its way to the Supreme Court. And even though it seems far-fetched, considering the far-right Republican makeup of the court, the Supreme Court theoretically could decide January 6 was, in fact, an insurrection led by Donald Trump, which therefore disqualifies him from seeking re-election. And his name would not just be removed from the battleground states, but from every ballot in all 50 states. Now, we know the Roberts court. I mean, the Roberts court did decide to save Obamacare, but this was before Trump got three on the court. But uh, it's a pretty safe bet that this Roberts court is going to rule that presidential elections should never be decided by the Supreme Court. And they're going to argue, if it gets to the Supreme Court, that striking Trump's name from the ballots would be the height of judicial overreach. That's what they're going to rule. But there's only one problem with their reasoning. 
Bush v. Gore on December 13th, 2000. If you remember, the Supreme Court stopped the recount in Florida and declared unilaterally that George W. Bush won. Bush was awarded the presidency by the Supreme Court, and most people at the time, especially Democrats, said, what's the worst that's going to happen? What's the worst that's going to happen? Now, you got to remember how outrageous this was. George W. Bush lost the popular vote to Al Gore. In other words, he clearly lost the presidential election, and he tried to win dirty in Florida, where his brother, Jeb, was governor, and he, Jeb, and Catherine Harris were scrubbing black people from the voter rolls, right? The optics alone, and optics are important when it comes to the Supreme Court, the optics alone were reason enough for the Supreme Court to send the case, to, I guess, remand, is that the word? Send it back to the Florida Supreme Court, which would have, which was a Democratic Supreme Court, and they would have said, let's continue counting the votes. Instead, our Supreme Court decided that all elections are inaccurate representations of the people's will. When you wonder where Trump gets the idea of voter fraud and, and with abandon, he just claims voter fraud, it comes from Bush v. Gore, written by Antonin Scalia, where he's basically said all elections are inaccurate representations of the people's will. An election, the Supreme Court ruled, is a snapshot of what the people want. And each snapshot, according to this ruling, renders a different outcome. The court said because different counties in Florida had different determinations of what constitutes a valid vote, the voters in Florida were being deprived equal protection under the law. Therefore, we go with this snapshot. No more snapshots. We're going to go with the snapshot of George W. Bush winning the presidential election. There are other snapshots that could show Al Gore winning the election, but we're going to go with this snapshot, this count that says George W. Bush won. The court said it's impossible to accurately count votes, so let's just stop and give it to Bush. It is from this decision that flows Donald Trump's false claims of election fraud. The Supreme Court basically gave Giuliani and Trump permission to claim that, you know, all elections are fraudulent. It, it wasn't, the election wasn't impossible to count. They just had d different counties set as a dimpled Chad, a legitimate vote. They, they couldn't decide what was legitimate and what wasn't legitimate. But had they tallied all the votes, this, this was decided uh, in December of 2001, right? More than a year later, in December of 2001, a consortium of news, newspapers in Florida got their hands on all the ballots and did a recount and concluded that Al Gore, under any scenario with Dimple Chads being counted or not being counted, Al Gore won. Had Al Gore just asked that we recount all the ballots instead of trying to be cute and just asking for a recount in, in districts that he thought he could win, had he asked for a statewide recount, he would have won uh, no matter what scenario was presented, okay? This was in December of 2001. They established in Florida that George W. Bush was an illegitimate president, but by December of 2001, he had a 90% approval rating because he didn't pay attention to intelligence briefings that said Osama bin Laden intent 
on flying planes into the World Trade Center. And in America, when a president screws up that massively, we rally behind him. So it didn't matter that he was illegitimate. Once the World Trade Center, once those buildings came down, he was our president. That was the gift of Bush v. Gore, Antonin Scalia, December 2000, just handing the president presidency to George W. Bush. And the court, uh, in a poorly worded decision written by Antonin Scalia, he wrote that nothing in my ruling, or this ruling, he said, should serve or be used as precedent in any future court decisions. He basically said, this bullshit. That's what he said. Don't, he said, do not rely on anything in this decision for future de- There's no stare decisis here. Just ignore this. We're giving the presidency to George W. Bush and now ignore everything in this ruling because none of it is a building block for future decisions. Again, this decision, Bush v. Gore, uh, informed the memos that were written by Kenneth Cheesebro, who, as a disciple of Harvard Law professor and Gore advocate, Lawrence Tribe, Kenneth Cheesebro helped draft legal briefs in 2000 supporting Gore's right to a statewide recount in Florida. But like Kenneth Cheesebro's co-defendant down in Georgia, John Eastman, Cheesebro became part of this brand new fiery breed of conservative lawyers, Uh, conservative lawyers, Republican lawyers who walked away from 2000, Bush v. Gore, convinced that elections are not won at the ballot box. They are won in the courts through legal challenges and loopholes. So if you want to know why Trump was so confident in screaming election fraud and why Eastman and Cheesebro were so confident in their flimsy interpretation of the Constitution and the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act, they got it all, they got their confidence from Antonin Scalia's Bush v. Gore decision, giving just randomly, with, with no legitimate excuse, just giving the presidency to George W. Bush, because what's the worst that could happen? So now we have Lawrence Tribe and and a lot of Democratic uh, lawyers using the 14th Amendment to go battleground by battleground to try to get Trump kicked off the ballot. Is this the path Democrats should follow? Because it kind of smells like something Republicans do. I see no choice. Uh, I see, I think you have to do this. Uh, It's the courts. We're up against the courts now. Uh, Through wrongheaded decisions like Shelby versus Holder that have made it harder for black people to vote, when it comes to democracy, we're up against the courts If you're going to win elections, you got to go where the ball is. Follow the ball, not where the ball should be, where you wish it should be, where you studied in college for the ball to be, but now you're out of college and the ball's someplace else and you're unprepared. You got to go where the ball is. And Republicans have taken the ball out of the ballot box and moved it into two specific arenas, the courts and, of course, the Electoral College. And a lot of my friends say that's not fair. Yeah, I know, but that's where the ball is. It's in the courts and the Electoral College. And we're not getting rid of the Electoral College anytime soon. Now, I know I've defended the Electoral College in the past. I still believe not because it's, it's, a, it's a holdover to the antebellum South and protects slaveholders. 
I have other reasons for believing in the Electoral College that I don't want to get into now, but I know I'm pissing off a lot of people. The fact of the matter is the Electoral College is where the ball is, and we're not getting rid of it by next year. So Democrats need to learn how to win not just the battleground states, but they need to win in places like Ohio or Florida that used to be battleground states. Somehow they've been written off as lost causes. Why? Why do you think? I have some ideas. Leave a comment. I have some ideas as to why the Democrats can't win in Ohio or Florida anymore. Obviously, it's a problem with our leadership. But why do you think we, we now consistently lose Ohio and Florida? And the ball is not only in the Electoral College. The ball is in our courts. So we have to start working the levers of our courts better than the Republicans do. You know, America has become an oligarchy, but uh, instead of billionaires fronting the status quo, it's our judges who more often than not are handed to us by the Federalist Society or the Heritage Foundation, which are nothing more than front groups for big oil and inherited wealth. The courts are where the ball is. So when a democratically elected president issues an executive order or a democratically controlled Congress passes a bill that benefits unions, the environment, the poor, Republicans say, nice, but we're taking it to the courts. And it's the courts, the black-robed tools of the oligarchs, who decide what we get. So we have to focus on the courts and the electoral college. Again, no fan of Hillary's, okay? I voted for her. I voted for her husband twice. No fan, but I voted for them. And this is... I have a lot of listeners who hate the Clintons, okay? But it bears repeating. We would be looking at a completely different America had Hillary Clinton won in 2016. We would be looking at a completely different America if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016. And it is conceivable that I would have become a fan of hers because I remember Hillary Care. I remember the first thing she did as first lady was say, our health care system is rotten to its core. And she introduced Hillary Care, which wasn't socialized medicine, but it's a lot better than what we have now. And she got crucified for trying to save our lives with Hillary Care. Okay, so, you know, uh, I'm a Bernie supporter, but this country, you'd be looking at a completely different country domestically, maybe not. She might be a, a hawk when it comes to foreign affairs, but domestically, we'd be looking at a completely different America. Now, assuming this would now be her second term, okay? Yeah, this would now be her second term. I'm going to tell you something that's going to upset you. If this were Hillary's second term, four, four Supreme Court justices would have been hers. She would have picked four Supreme Court justices, okay? Hillary wins in 2016. No Gorsuch, no rapist, Brett Kavanaugh, and no Barrett. It's a completely different court, right? She would have picked Jackson, so that gives her four. It's a completely different court and therefore a completely different country, right? 
the eviction moratorium was overturned by the Supreme Court, right? What else am I forgetting? Oh, yeah, Roe v. Wade and stricter gun laws would still be on the books. And the court would have overturned Citizens United. If you remember, Citizens United was all about an attack ad against Hillary Clinton. So we'd be looking at a completely different country had Hillary won in 2016. Now, you know I wanted Bernie in 2016 and in 2020. But you know who Bernie wanted in 2016? Hillary. And in 2020, he wanted Biden. After he didn't get the nominations, he said, I'm going to suck it up. Both times, he was, you know, I think the Democrats cheated him out of 2016. They, che- they certainly cheated him out of 2020. But, uh, you know, you, uh, that's where the ball was. The ball was with Hillary and then Biden. That's where the ball is, and you got to go where the ball is. I know a lot of you don't want to hear this. I know I can feel it. I can just feel people m- mad at me for, for saying this. Uh, so I welcome your comments. Uh, I'm not saying this with certitude. Uh, this is what I feel. Uh, for example, on Tuesday, I'm posing this as a question. On Tuesday, Gabe Ammo, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name properly. Uh, on Tuesday, Gabe Ammo got the Democratic nomination to fill a vacant congressional seat in a heavily Democratic district in Rhode Island, which means he's going to win in November. So Gabe Ammo is going to be the new uh, uh, congressman from Rhode Island. Cicilline quit. And so Gabe Ammo is a moderate who worked in both uh, the Obama and the Biden White Houses. And going into Tuesday's elections, we all thought Aaron Regenberg, who I had on my show two months ago, I love him, we all thought he was going to win. And uh, Howie Klein endorsed him. He brought him on the show. We all fell in love with Aaron Regenberg. He was supposed to win. He didn't. Uh, He's a former state legislator in Rhode Island. Bernie and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez were actively working to get him the nomination. But the moderate, Gabe Ammo, won. I think Aaron Regenberg is amazing, and he's now going to go work for Public Citizen. That's the public lobbying group founded by Ralph Nader. So uh, Public Citizen is the people's lobbyist. You should check out public citizens website and give them money you should always donate to public citizen so what's going on why uh, did our friend Aaron Regenberg lose to a, a party hack he had AOC he had Bernie uh, what what's going on in our party why is it moving Seemingly, here was a choice. This wasn't a presidential primary. This was an opportunity to elect uh, Aaron Rugenberg, who was, you know, a little more to the left than Cicilline. What happened? Uh, Why is it so hard to get the Democratic Party to move to the left? Is is it the is it the, the party just stacking the deck? Or is the Democratic Party made up of moderate hacks? Uh, Why is it so hard? Uh, Let me know why you think the Democratic Party isn't moving as far to the left as we think it should. I know that sometimes we don't get an opportunity to vote for people like Aaron Regenberg. But the people of Rhode Island 
had a choice, and they went with the political hack. Why? Uh, you know, other countries have oligarchies. And, you know, let's not kid ourselves. America is an oligarchy. Uh, but that's a temporary phenomenon. We're through, this is an oligarchy phase that we're going through. We saw this in South America. Countries have oligarchies, and then they have democratic reform. But we don't seem to be having the reform that's necessary. We seem to be moving further and further towards right-wing authoritarian oligarchs. Uh, other countries are able to vote their way out from underneath the iron grip of an oligarchy. I mean, look at what happened in Brazil last year. Lula was voted back into office. Wasn't easy, but you know, he took office in January. There was a mini insurrection, but they were able to do it. Look at what's happening in Guatemala right now. There's a new president elect. His name is Bernardo Aravello. He won last month. He shocked the power structure. He's a progressive lawmaker, an academic, and he's uh, the leader of the seed movement. That's a party. That party has come under attack. It was outlawed. They outlawed his party. But somehow he was able to get elected president. Now, there are four months until he's inaugurated, and a lot can happen. The right wing in Guatemala is doing everything they can to stop him from being sworn in. We'll be following this very closely, but could someone like Bernardo Arevalo happen in America? Could Lula happen in America? Is there something about our character as a nation, as a people, that prevents candidates like Lula from ever holding the seat of power? So let me ask you this question, if you don't mind. Okay? This is a hypothetical. And I don't know the answer to this. I'd be curious to know what you think. Okay? So America in 2016 elected Donald Trump. The powers that be were willing to take a chance on a crazy, broken-down, fake billionaire, okay? But by 2020, a lot of Americans were ready to take a chance on a sober, thoughtful, democratic socialist by the name of Bernie Sanders. And Bernie, you know, he should have been nominated. He didn't get the nomination because the forces within the Democratic Party uh, the same exact forces that made sure Gabe Ammo won in Rhode Island instead of our friend Aaron Regenberger, Regenberg, those forces made sure that Biden, not Bernie, became the nominee in 2020, despite Biden being the least popular of all the major candidates running for the Democratic nomination in 2020. They put their hands on the scale for Joe Biden. It was Clyburn in South Carolina. They were trying to build this firewall for Biden in South Carolina. If he could win South Carolina, then he could stop Bernie and go right to the nomination. And Obama, the Clintons, Pelosi, Clyburn, they all put their hands on the scale. They got Buttigieg, who was beating Biden. Buttigieg beat Biden in Iowa and New Hampshire. Elizabeth Warren was beating Biden. Uh, they all dropped out and endorsed Biden. And uh, Bernie didn't have a shot. The power, they circled the wagons for the neoliberal Biden, not Bernie. Even though in terms of polling and delegates, he was way, way, way behind Bernie, Buttigieg, and Warren. But the powers that be said, don't worry about the delegates and don't worry about the polling. We'll make Joe Biden president. And uh, 
you know, I voted for Biden. He's a Democrat. He's a hack. Uh, he was like the lead. You know, you know, I wanted Bernie, then Elizabeth Warren. And I can't remember. I guess I would have. He, I don't even think Biden was in my top four. Uh, I voted for him, and he won. Okay, a a neoliberal hack by the name of Joe Biden became the president elect of this country. Again, I voted for him, and I'm voting for him again. And I will. The closer we get to the general, I will make a case for him. But he's not my favorite. So we got this neoliberal hack elected. And what happened? January 6th. Uh, in the run-up to January 6th, you had serious people in the Republican Party who saw no difference between Bernie and Biden, right? They always say, you know, you might as well, if you're a Democrat, you might as well be a socialist. They're going to call you one anyway. And these Republicans, a lot of sober-minded Republicans, if there's such a thing, were convinced that Biden was a socialist and Trump had to remain in office by any means necessary. And, you know, they were thinking, let's get it to the Supreme Court. They'll do what they did with Bush v. Gore, right? If we can just get this election to the Supreme Court, it's worse now. In 2020, it was worse in 2020 than it was 20 years previously when they gave the presidency to George W. Bush. That's what everybody in the Trump White House was thinking, because they were informed by Bush v. Gore, by Scalia's decision. We just have to get it to the courts. Let's do the Green Bay sweep. Let's just hold up January 6th. Just keep doing challenges and will create so much confusion and chaos, the Supreme Court will have to make a decision. And as I keep saying, and I'm going to keep telling you what the plan, the plan was, delay, delay, delay on January 6th, have it drag out until January 10th. The Supreme Court would step in and say, okay, the Congress has to decide the election and because of the way those votes would be weighted, each state gets one vote and the vote is determined by your delegation. Do you have more Democrats and more Republicans in your delegation? If you have more Democrats, you get one vote for Biden. More Republicans, you get one vote for Trump. Thing is, Montana, which isn't really a state, has the same number of votes as California. And there are more red states than there are blue states. This is what Peter Navarro understood, Steve Bannon, Kenneth Cheesebro, John Eastman. If we can just get the election decided by Congress, Trump gets reelected by any means necessary. Okay? That was the plan. So... Just as an intellectual exercise, I wanted Bernie. Now, this is what happened. January 6th is what happened with a neoliberal hack, Joe Biden, as president-elect. What would have happened if my fantasy came to fruition and Bernie Sanders, who I consider a miracle of democracy, what would have happened had it been Bernie instead of Biden. And it wasn't the revolution that, you know, Bernie always said, if I win, it's going to be a revolution. It's going to be a landslide like Roosevelt's in 32. I'm going to have the House and the Senate. It's going to usher in a new, new era. But we don't have landslides anymore in America. So what would have happened had Bernie won instead of Biden? But it wasn't a landslide. It was a nice win, but not... You know, he won by 70 electoral votes, 80 electoral votes. What do you think January 6th would have been like had it been Bernie? I don't know. But try to imagine if it's Bernie 
as president-elect, and Trump is you know, refusing to leave office. What kind of support do you think Donald Trump would have gotten, not from within his own party, but from the Democrats as well? Okay? I, I'm asking. I have some ideas. Uh, given what we now know about Hakeem Jeffries, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, uh, do you think they would have been happy that Bernie Sanders was the president-elect? Uh, do you think they would have said he's the duly elected president-elect? We have to stand by him. Or would they been a little more quiet? Would they have found secret solace in Peter Navarro's Green Bay sweep? Would Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, would they have secretly preferred the Green Bay sweep where each slate of electors is challenged and suddenly January 6th is dragged on and on until it's January 10th and the Supreme Court has to decide to throw it back to Congress and Donald Trump gets reelected? I don't know. What do you think... Pelosi, Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, Steny Hoyer. What do you think was in their best interests? Another four years of Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders, who was maybe going to shake things up and uh, put an end to their money train? Uh, what do you think? I'd be very curious to know what you think. Please leave a comment. Uh, what would have happened if Bernie somehow sneaked past the Democratic Party's gatekeepers the same way Donald Trump supposedly snuck back, sneaked uh, past the Republican Party's gatekeepers, right? We're, that's what we're told, that uh, Donald, because they don't have superdelegates, in the Republican Party, they can't control the nomination. The way Democratic Party has superdelegates, unelected superdelegates who say, uh-uh, not Bernie, Hillary. Republicans don't have superdelegates, so it was easy for Trump to sneak past the establishment. What would have happened if somehow Bernie had so much support he got the nomination? They got the nomination, and then he won the presidency. Schumer and Pelosi, uh, how would they have viewed his impending inauguration? I think, and I'd be curious to know what you think. Uh, maybe I'm cynical. Maybe I'm bitter. Maybe I'm angry uh, about the election results in Rhode Island this week. But I think Schumer and Pelosi maybe would have treated Bernie's impending inauguration the same way they treat Medicare for all. They would have said, yeah, it's, a, you know, hey, it's a good idea on paper, but we're just not ready for it. Uh, so I don't think there would have been a riot on January 6th. I think it would have been unnecessary. This is what I think, okay? I, I think if Bernie won, there would have been no insurrection on January 6th, I think Pelosi, Pelosi and Schumer would have passively allowed Peter Navarro's Green Bay sweep to work its magic. And they would have acted like they were appalled by the Green Bay sweep. And I think they would have convinced themselves that they were appalled by the Green Bay sweep. They, they would have said this outrageous parliamentary chicanery uh, defies disbelief. But just like in 2000, Bush v. Gore, they would have accepted the Supreme Court handing the presidency to Trump. The same way Clinton and Gore and the Democrats accepted Bush v. Gore in December of 2000. Well, the Supreme Court has ruled. Our hands are tied even though Al Gore won the popular vote and Jeb Bush stole Florida for his brother 
and the Supreme Court finished the deed, we're just going to accept it. Do you think had it been the other way around, uh, the Republicans would have accepted it as magnanimously as Gore did? That's remember how they always isn't isn't Al Gore a patriot? Look how magnanimously he walked away from the presidency. That's the story of the Democratic Party, isn't it? Yes, we're we're magnanimous. We're we're better than they are. We keep losing, but we're better than they are. Uh, If they keep winning, they're better than we are. This is America. So I don't know. I don't know what would have happened had Bernie won. I see what I find so depressing about ammo winning in Rhode Island is it cannot just be Bernie or Cori Bush. We need a a leftist pat we need an infrastructure in the Democratic Party that props up Cory Bush or Ted Lieu or or Bernie or AOC. Do we have that infrastructure within the Dem- Democratic Party? I found it very disheartening this week to see the results in Rhode Island. Peter Navarro uh, came up with the Green Bay sweep along with Steve Bannon. The two of them uh, were subpoenaed by the January 6th committee. They wanted to know about the Green Bay sweep, and Steve Bannon refused to testify about the Green Bay sweep, and he was convicted last year of contempt of Congress. He may end up going to prison. It's on appeal. And Peter Navarro's trial began on Wednesday. Same charges, same contempt of Congress. And if you remember, Navarro, Dr. Navarro, Dr. Navarro sounds like, uh, I won't say it. Uh, Dr. Navarro served as Trump's director of the White House Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. But more importantly, he was a political advisor and an election denier, right, after the 2020 presidential election. Green Bay sweep, this was his idea, flood the zone on January 6th. You know, Hunter Biden, right, that's an example of flooding the zone. Do you understand anything that's going on with Hunter Biden It's Benghazi. It's flooding the zone. Make people so confused. They think, well, there must be. There's so much smoke. There has to be fire, right? That's what they were going to do on January 6th. Flood the zone. That's the Green Bay sweep. Have 100 congressmen and Republican senators like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz work with the congressmen and challenge every slate of electors from uh, from swing states and let this thing drag on. Chaos in the streets. Supreme Court steps in. That was the plan. So Peter Navarro, like Steve Bannon, they weren't going to testify before the January 6th committee because that was the plan. The, 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 the plan wasn't the insurrection, just to, the riot. The plan was the Green Bay sweep, which is why the guys who came up with it, Peter Navarro and and uh, Steve Bannon, weren't going to testify because that would have given away the whole game to the January 6th committee. And uh, so if Peter Navarro is found guilty of contempt of Congress, he he's going to go to prison for, I think, six months to a year. The trial is expected to wrap up by the end of the week. And we could have a verdict as soon as Monday. Navarro, I don't want to get into trouble here, but a lot of people are saying he's unhinged. Uh, On Wednesday, he seemed, court observers say it was bizarre. His behavior was bizarre. He reportedly stood during the entire six-hour hearing. Who does that? Who's allowed to do that? Why didn't the judge tell him to sit down? Navarro was reportedly pacing, fidgeting, twitching, unable to remain still. Prosecutors on Wednesday charged Navarro of thinking he was above the law. Navarro's attorney, the great Stanley Woodward, Stanley Woodward, 
In his opening remarks, Stanley Woodward said, and this is really funny, Stanley Woodward said, yeah, we agree that Peter Navarro failed to respond to the congressional subpoena in a timely fashion. Uh, But we believe it was the January 6th committee's fault for not finding out whether or not Donald Trump had given him executive privilege. I know, this is what he said, I know it was Peter Navarro who was invoking executive privilege and he was supposed to provide the documents proving that Donald Trump gave him executive privilege uh, so he wouldn't have to testify, but he didn't deliver the documents because he never, this is, I'm not making that because he never really officially got executive privilege from Donald Trump. But we believe that executive privilege is implicit that he would have given Peter Navarro executive privilege if Peter got around to asking, but he didn't. And we feel it's the January 6th committee's fault for not doing what Peter Nav- This is what he said. It, we feel it's the January 6th committee's fault for not doing what Peter Navarro should have done and call up Donald Trump and say, hey, are you giving him executive privilege or can he testify? Wow. Uh, you know, I think I could have been a better defense attorney for Peter Navarro than Stanley Woodward. Well, Stanley Woodward's very busy, right? Uh, yes, my client ignored the subpoena. And yes, he's now claiming executive privilege, which Donald Trump never granted. But we believe it was your job, the job of the January 6th committee, to ask Donald Trump about executive privilege and not my client's job. Uh, okay. It's never anybody's fault. If you're a Republican or a conservative, it's always somebody else's fault. They never take the blame. Well, things are getting... How are we doing on time here? Okay. Things are getting serious in the Georgia racketeering case. Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell, those are the two lawyers who are also among the 17 co-defendants. They've asked for a speedy trial in Georgia you're allowed to ask for a speedy trial unless you're in Fulton County Jail, in which case you can wait eight months, six months, two years before you're indicted or charged. But if you're white, uh, you're entitled to a speedy trial in Georgia. So both Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell are asking for speedy trials. Kenneth Cheesebro was given one which means his trial begins for him on October 23rd. And Sidney Powell has also asked for a speedy trial, and she's requesting that she be tried alongside Kenneth Cheesebro. But Kenneth Cheesebro wants his own trial, and then Sidney Powell's lawyer said, you know what, on second thought, we want our own trial as well. So they want speedy trials and they don't want to be tried together. And they took it, the, the, the racketeering trial started on Wednesday. It was televised, and it's on. The trial is on. So they went before Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee. He's the presiding judge in this trial. And they were basically arguing for a divorce. Cheesebro <laughs> wanted a divorce from Sidney Powell. Uh, Cheesebro's lawyers and Powell's lawyers, they insisted their client, their clients don't know each other. They never communicated with each other, and therefore they should have separate trials, speedy and separate trials. Both lawyers uh, insisted that their clients, while indicted for racketeering, are accused of playing different roles in the racket, and it would be unfair to try them together. They describe them as two separate buckets of the racket. The lawyers for Sidney Powell said she's accused of breaking into a Coffee County voting machine, which is completely different from what Cheesebro was accused of, and that is organizing the phony elector scheme. That's not entirely true. Sidney Powell was in, according to the indictment. That's a, the, uh, that's a bogus argument. 
and they're not two entirely separate buckets. And Judge McAfee said, no, you both want a speedy trial. You're going to get your speedy trial, but you're going to be tried at the same time. This is a RICO trial, and in RICO trials, co-defendants get tried in the same room. Usually, however, Judge McAfee said he still hasn't decided whether all 19 co-defendants will be brought to trial on October 23rd, along with Cheesebro and Powell. It looks, as of Wednesday, it looks like Cheesebro and Sidney Powell will be tried starting October 23rd, and the other 17 co-defendants will be tried later on this year or maybe in March of next year. McAfee, Judge McAfee has expressed skepticism. He said on Wednesday that he doesn't believe Fulton County District Attorney Fawny Willis can try all 19 defendants at the same time. Meanwhile, uh, I think we're done, right? Okay. Meanwhile, uh, Fawny Willis has filed a motion to keep the names of all the jurors on this case, on this trial, secret. Uh, there's been a problem with doxing, right? The grand jury that indicted Trump and the 18 co-defendants, the grand jury was doxed. In her filing, Willis wrote, based on the doxing of Fulton County grand jurors and the Fulton County district attorney, she got doxed. Uh, she says it is clearly foreseeable that trial jurors will likely be doxed should their names be made available to the public. She went on to say, if that were to happen, the effect on jurors' ability to decide the issues before them impartially and without influence would undoubtedly be placed in jeopardy and uh, it would affect all of the defendants' constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury trial. There was some other stuff going on. Okay, Hurricane Lee, which also is my porn name, is been bumped up to a Category 4 hurricane. They didn't think it was going to be that severe, but they're now saying it could hit Puerto Rico as a Category 4. It could hit the Virgin Islands as a Category 4 this weekend. So the hurricanes, because of the Atlantic Ocean heating up, they're getting more frequent and more intense. And the second E. Jean Carroll trial is scheduled for the same date as the Iowa caucuses. And Judge Kaplan announced on Wednesday Donald Trump has lost the second trial. If you remember, about three months ago, Trump lost the first E. Jean Carroll defamation suit. He has to pay her $5 million. Now there's a second defamation suit that she's filed, where I believe she's asking for an additional $10 million. And Kaplan told Trump's lawyers, oh, you lost this. We're going to uh, start picking a jury to determine what the damages are. So that was uh, not a good day. Wednesday wasn't a good day for uh, Trump summary judgment on the second E. Jean Carroll defamation loss. Summary judgment means no, no trial. We don't, we don't need a jury. The, ju the judge is ruling from the bench. Now we just need to do voir dire, pick a jury to determine how, how much more Donald Trump has to pay E. Jean Carroll uh, for defaming her and raping her. This is the same Judge Kaplan who has twice written it was rape, not sexual assault. It was rape. More bad news for Donald Trump. If you remember, he's being sued by Letitia James, the New York State Attorney General, for $250 million for fraud for falsely inflating the value of his real estate in order to secure loans from banks and then devalu devaluing the worth 
of his real estate when it comes to paying taxes. And he keeps filing motions to delay the trial, which begins in October in New York State. He keeps uh, having his lawyers saying, this isn't Letitia James's jurisdiction. I shouldn't be tried by New York State Attorney General for fraud. This is a federal case, not a state case. Well, the judge for the third time ruled, stop, stop. These delays, quote, are completely without merit and the trial will proceed in the state courts. I don't know. What do you think? I think he's going to prison. I do. I do. And I'm also, I also think this 14th Amendment, I didn't, at first I thought it was a pipe dream, but then I read the, uh, the lawsuit filed in Colorado, and I thought, oh, huh, this could happen. Stay hopeful. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you for listening. Please, uh, what am I supposed to ask you to do? Like this video, please. Please share it with your friends. Please uh, subscribe to my channel. Please comment. I'm very interested in what people have to say, so please comment on this. Please subscribe to my newsletter. And thank you to the moderators in our chat room who keep the conversation lively and interesting. I will see you same time tomorrow. I'm going to try to do 12.05 a.m. Eastern. Thank you for putting up with my nonsense.